In the last several years, tattoos and body piercings have become extremely common, perhaps more popular than they've ever been in history. The movie stars have them, the sports figures have them. In fact, a news story dated April 30th, 2009 says that Barbie now has them. In celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Barbie doll, Mattel has created a new Barbie complete with tattoos and a toy tattoo gun so that children can stamp themselves with washable tattoos. The American Academy of Dermatology website references a 2004 survey with people from the ages of 18 to 50, which revealed that 24% of the people surveyed reported having a tattoo. A Harris poll dated February 12, 2008 stated that 32% of those ages 25 to 29 had a tattoo and 25% of those aged 30 to 39. And because they are so popular, it's a topic that young people have to deal with and that Christians have a lot of questions about. I personally have had people come to me and ask, is it right for a Christian to get a tattoo? Or is it right to have multiple piercings in your ear? What about a ring in your nose? And at times, it's young people wanting to know the answers to these questions. Other times, it's parents who've been discussing it with their children, and they want to know what the Bible has to say about this subject. Now, in light of these things, I think it's appropriate that we spend some time trying to answer these questions. We want to know, does the Bible address these issues? Is this a matter of right and wrong, or is it purely a matter of opinion? In this study, we're going to seek to answer these questions, and we want to be very fair in our approach. Our goal is not to shame those who have tattoos, nor is it to reach unwarranted conclusions. Our goal is to examine this topic in light of relevant Bible passages, and then to draw accurate conclusions. Now first, I want to discuss some misconceptions that people have about what the Bible says about tattoos. Frequently when discussing the subject of tattoos or body piercings, you'll hear somebody say, well, the Bible specifically forbids that. The fact is, there's no passage in the Bible that says, thou shalt not get a tattoo. Now many times, people will go to a passage in the Old Testament that they believe addresses our question. Specifically, they will use Leviticus 19 and verse 28, where the Bible says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. I want to suggest to you that I don't believe that's an accurate use of that particular passage. You know, first, we've got to be very careful about trying to use an Old Testament passage as a proof text for what we can or cannot do in the Christian age. The law of Moses has been nailed to the cross. And it's not the standard by which we live today. But I also want you to notice with me that this same chapter, which forbids putting marks on your body, also gives instructions concerning animal sacrifices. It requires leaving certain portions of your crops unharvested. It forbids sowing two types of seed in the same field. It tells the Hebrews that they were not to wear a garment with two different types of fabric, wool and linen mixed. There are also restrictions about how a man's hair was to be cut and ways in which he wasn't allowed to trim his beard. Now, I would ask, why would you pick out one of these things and try to bind it and ignore the others? The context of Leviticus 19, 27, and 28 is that of keeping the people away from heathen practices and things associated with idolatry. Cutting the flesh is mentioned, and you may remember from 1 Kings 18 and verse 28 that that was associated with the worship of Baal. And there's archaeological evidence that indicates that some of the Canaanites would tattoo themselves with the names or symbols of their favorite gods. This appears to be what's being forbidden, not the modern practice of tattoos. The idea is that the Jews were not to identify themselves with the heathen practices or the idolatrous religions that surrounded them. And so Christians should be careful when making arguments from the Bible that we don't make bad arguments. Because number one, it hurts our credibility and the case that we're trying to make. And number two, it really isn't handling aright the Word of God. Now, perhaps there is a principle in Leviticus 19 that we're not to associate ourselves with ungodly things, but that would be all that we could get from that passage. And so back to my point, there is no passage that says, thou shalt not get a tattoo. But you know, just because there is no direct prohibition against tattoos, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right to get one. 
You know, there's no passage in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not inject heroin into thy veins. But we understand that it's wrong to do that because of Bible principles. And so in determining if an activity is right or wrong, a Christian needs to ask himself certain questions. He needs to ask himself questions such as, What would this do to my influence? Would this be a stumbling block for other people? Is engaging in this practice good stewardship? Will this have any negative effects on me as a servant of God? So let's discuss some biblical principles that have bearing on this issue of tattoos and body piercings. Number one, I want to talk about the principle of influence. I want to begin by looking at a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a rather unusual discussion there that takes place dealing with the subject of the wearing of veils. In verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, that is, without a veil on, dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered, that is, let her wear her veil. Now, some have concluded that this passage applies to all women for all times. I don't believe that's correct. In fact, I think that it's being made clear that's not the point in verse 16 when Paul writes, But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, if the point of this passage is not that all women for all time must have their heads covered when they worship, then why does Paul command the women in Corinth to do so? I believe the fact is that in that particular city, in that particular time, it was customary for a woman to wear a veil. And to not do so was to send a message that was rebellious in nature. It was to reject the authority of her husband. And so for a Christian woman to refuse to wear a veil, she was sending a message that in that culture would be very offensive. It was an association that a Christian woman would not want to have. Now, what connection does that have with tattoos? In our current society, tattoos send a particular message. For years, tattoos have been associated with counterculture. Tattoos and unusual body piercings send a message that I'm a certain type of person or I'm associated with a certain type of people. A former police officer told me that when he was on the police force, that as more and more officers began getting tattoos, the department asked that the officers only get tattoos in places that could be hidden by their uniforms. And the reason they gave was they were concerned about the message that it would send to the public. On the internet, there are numerous news stories that discuss the problem of tattoos and body art in the workplace. One article from Fox News points out that some employers are having to write very specific dress codes to address this issue that they deem as a problem. Many employers are requiring that their staff dress in such a way as to hide their tattoos because they don't like the message that it sends. I mentioned to you earlier about the new Tattoo Barbie doll. I want to read you an excerpt from an article that talks about this new doll. It says, Parents have already rallied up against Mattel, asking for the dolls to be pulled off the market. One parent asked, Whatever will they bring out next? Drug addict Barbie? Alcoholic Barbie? Now, why are parents rallying against Mattel to have this doll removed? It's because in our society, tattoos have negative connotations. My name is Patrick Cryenbear, and uh, I used to be a tattoo artist. I started when I was 13 years old. Um, I was a runaway at the time, and it was a way for me to make ends meet. And over a period of time, it eventually became a, a better way to make ends meet. And I used to own six shops in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I did tattoos for a living for quite some time there and body piercings. I started off with one tattoo, as most people do, you know, and uh, being on the street and everything like that, it quickly grew into more and and uh, never really thought I'd get a lot of tattoos, but I, my entire back is done, my legs, my arms, my chest, my stomach, um, pretty much all, all of my body is tattooed. Having tattoos has affected me in getting jobs, in getting housing, 
in in a lot of things, uh, getting a good table at a restaurant and uh, getting a taxi cab to pick you up and asking for directions. People, I've had people run away from me and get in their car and drive off rather than ask, answer a simple question like, where's the payphone at? Things like that. It, they tend to intimidate people and uh, it makes you unapproachable. Now, what does all of this have to do with 1 Corinthians chapter 11? The point is this. Society's view of a particular issue can make it sinful for a Christian. If society views not wearing a veil as rebellious and overstepping one's bounds, then a Christian should not do it. And in light of that, if we conclude today that a Christian having tattoos or excessive piercings is viewed as rebellious or associated with sin, then without a doubt a Christian should avoid it. And if he does it anyway, it's going to be hurtful to the church and it's going to be hurtful to his influence. And while we're talking about influence, let me mention also that oftentimes the places that a person has to go to get tattoos can also be harmful to his influence. You know, there are certain places that it's not good for a Christian to go. It's not good for a Christian to go to a bar even if he doesn't drink. It's not good to go to a strip club even if he doesn't look. It's not good to go into a casino even if he doesn't gamble. And the reason, of course, is it's destructive to his influence. Now, what about tattoo parlors? Generally speaking, they have very seedy reputations. Oftentimes, their names speak volumes. For example, here are some names. Sinful Inflictions, Dark Images, Red Devil Tattoo and Piercings. In fact, after doing some research online, I was surprised how many tattoo parlors have the word sinful in their names. Tattooing has always been associated with uh, the bad boy image, uh, bikers, uh, gang members, people that have been in prison, jails, institutions, that sort of thing. A second principle that we want to consider is modesty. Now, the point that I'm making here is not what you might be thinking. I'm not referring to showing too much skin, although that could be related, but rather I'm referring to a word that appears in the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. Now, I'm going to read you this passage, and then we're going to discuss it. It says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, there are four words or phrases that I want to pick out of this text. The first word I want to look at is the word modest. This word means orderly, well-arranged, or decent. And the idea is that she is not to adorn herself or beautify herself in a way that draws undue attention to herself. Now, in the immediate context, he's discussing a woman overdoing it. That is, she's wearing flashy clothes and lots of makeup and expensive jewelry. Now, of course, a woman could also draw undue attention to herself by underdoing it. That is, by wearing too little. But I want you to consider this statement in light of tattoos and body piercing. Can a woman, or a man for that matter, draw undue attention to himself or herself with tattoos, or with a nose ring, or by having their navel pierced? You know, an honest person would have to answer yes to this question. Now, the second word that we want to consider in this passage is the word shamefacedness. The word shamefacedness is actually closer to our modern word modest than the other one. The Greek word for shamefacedness means a sense of shame or modesty. Now, the third word is the word sobriety. Oftentimes, when we think of sobriety, we think of alcohol. Sobriety relates to being sober, one who hasn't had their senses or their judgment dulled by alcohol. Well, this word in the original language carries with it the idea of soundness of mind and self-control. It speaks of a person who is exercising good judgment. Now, the fourth phrase is from verse 10. It says, which becometh women professing godliness. In other words, in a manner that says to the world, I'm a servant of God. My most important concern is to be godly. Now, let's pull all of this together and see what we have. Christians are to adorn or decorate themselves in a way that does not draw undue attention to themselves. 
They should have a sense of shame and modesty about them. They should exercise good judgment. They should dress and adorn themselves so as to communicate that they are godly. Now let's ask the question, is that what tattoos communicate? Is that what having a stud in your tongue communicates? Does it show a sense of shame and good judgment? Is that what people are going to conclude when they look at you? You know, there's a particular type of tattoo that's been very popular in recent years. It's typically one gotten by women, and it's placed at the base of their back so that when their shirt raises up, it draws the tension of the eyes to that part of the back. I learned recently that that particular style of tattoo is commonly referred to as a tramp stamp. Now, in light of what we've just read in 1 Timothy 2, a person would have to admit that such a tattoo does not mesh with godly principles. Years ago when I was in the tattooing industry, uh, the trend seemed to have been a lot of girls uh, getting tattoos on their lower back, which has become deemed the tramp stamp. And uh, when I was in the industry, we were designing tattoos specifically for that area in different shapes to accentuate that part of the woman's body depending on what her shape was. And it was mostly just to draw attention to that area of the body. The third Bible principle that I want you to think about is stewardship. Now, we're going to talk about stewardship of our bodies, and then we're going to talk about stewardship of our money. Now, somebody might think, well, you know, stewardship, that's, that's a weak argument. But before you outright reject it, please take just a minute and consider the risk associated with this and think about the stewardship of your body in this light. The Mayo Clinic website states that tattoo inks are classified as cosmetics, so they aren't even regulated. They aren't approved by the FDA. The pigments and dyes used in tattoo inks aren't approved for injection under the skin. Long-term effects of these, the site says, are unknown. The site also lists some specific risks associated with getting a tattoo. The first risk they mention is blood-borne diseases to include hepatitis C, hepatitis B, tetanus, tuberculosis, and HIV. Now, in continuing the list of risk of tattoos, they also mention skin disorders, skin infections, allergic reactions, and on rare occasions, they can even cause problems when a person gets an MRI. In the tattooing industry, uh, when you do it professionally, Part of your test is is uh, knowing that you're exposed to 750 different bacterias and viruses that are airborne bacterias when you start tattooing somebody. And those are just uh, viruses and bacterias that are floating around in the air. And the danger comes in when you open up the skin and you start bleeding that uh, the viruses and bacterias have a greater opportunity of entering into the body. Um, the biggest problem nowadays uh, mostly is hepatitis C. Uh, you could contract the disease and it would not show itself for 15 years. And uh, in most cases, hepatitis C is a, is a death sentence. I personally know of 2,600 cases of hepatitis C virus being spread from one piercing gun in New York City. Well, someone might say, but I go to a clean, upscale tattoo parlor. The people there are professionals. Certainly the risks that you've just described aren't going to apply to me, but they do. You got to remember that the people that are doing these procedures on you are not medical doctors, and they're not really concerned with your health. All they're concerned with is getting the money that you've paid them to permanently disfigure your body. You know, over time, tattoos stretch and they fade and they can look really bad. And then, too, there's the regret factor. You know, for various reasons, a lot of people look back years later or maybe even soon afterwards and they regret that they got this marking on themselves that will be there for the rest of their lives. The tattoo is going to move with your skin. If your skin wrinkles, your tattoo is going to wrinkle. If you get put on a lot of weight, your tattoo is going to stretch. If you lose a lot of weight, your tattoo is going to shrink. If you get cut and get a scar there, you've just destroyed your tattoo that you probably paid minimum of $150, $200 for. And like I said, in most cases, 
your idea of what you thought was cool when you were in your 20s isn't so cool when you're 50. Uh, a lot of the regret that came from getting tattoos was people coming in wanting to get the name of their girlfriend or their wife tattooed on them, uh, husband, boyfriend, things of that nature. We would always try and talk them out of it because we knew that we'd be covering it up later. They always, uh, it, it's almost an omen that if you get uh, someone's name tattooed on you, unless it's your child or your parent, you're going to wind up splitting up with that person. So we, we used to, uh, we made it a rule that we would put the name on, but we'd do it in red ink or blue ink so we could cover it up easier. And stewardship of our bodies is not the only issue to consider. A second issue that we need to think about is stewardship of our money. Now, somebody might argue, it's my money. I can buy whatever I want to with it. But you know, that's not really true. All of our money belongs to the Lord, and we're just stewards of it. Now, someone else might say, well, you know, it's not wrong to purchase things we enjoy. You may spend your money on going to the movies or buying an iPod. I choose to spend mine on getting a tattoo. Well, we agree that it's not wrong to spend money on recreation and pleasurable activities, but when you do that, we always have to consider the stewardship principle. Depending on my personal financial situation and my bills and the amount of money that I should be giving to the Lord, it may be that buying an iPod is something that I shouldn't be doing. It may be that buying a new car right now might be poor stewardship. And so the stewardship principle is one that each of us needs to consider. We need to weigh it and we need to draw appropriate conclusions. And the fact is, tattoos can be very expensive. I need to ask myself, is this a wise use of my money? Will the Lord be pleased if I spend my money this way? According to Bill Johnson, the executive office director of the Alliance of Professional Tattooists, most tattoo artists charge an hourly rate that varies from about $75 to $150 per hour. And the length of time to do a tattoo can take from one hour to many hours, depending on the size and the complexity of the tattoo. Now, in addition, some tattoo artists charge 10% to 25% extra if the tattoo is on a more difficult part of the body, such as the lower back. And if you regret getting the tattoo, having it removed is even more expensive than getting it. It can take anywhere from 5 to 20 sessions to have a tattoo removed at a cost of $200 to $500 per session. If you calculate that out, you could be looking at as much as $10,000, and it can be very painful to have it removed. Laser tattoo removal has been compared to being splattered with hot grease, and so some choose to have a local anesthetic, which further ups the cost. Now, let's deal with some miscellaneous questions. Number one, somebody might ask, what if I only want to get a tattoo that is something simple and innocent, and I'm just going to get one, maybe a butterfly, something like that? You know, there are several factors that would influence the effects of having a tattoo. Factors like where on your body the tattoo is located, how many tattoos you have, what it is a tattoo of, all of these things are going to affect how people look at you. For example, a tattoo of a butterfly isn't going to be viewed the same as a skull and crossbones or, say, a tattoo of a black widow. But still, there are certain negative connotations associated with tattoos. 1 Timothy 5.14 speaks about not giving occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Still, you're going to have to go into a tattoo parlor to get one. Still, you're running a risk for infection and disease from bad needles. Still, you've got to deal with the principles of modesty and good judgment that we discussed in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, someone might ask this second question. What about getting a religious tattoo, perhaps even a cross, or something to profess your faith? You know, I would suggest that there are a lot of very ungodly people who have tattoos of crosses. And so having a cross is not necessarily going to set you apart. In fact, having a tattoo is going to make you more like them. You know, if professing your faith is what you're trying to do, tattoos are not the way to do it. Try teaching the gospel and dressing modestly and living a godly life. These things are far more effective than a tattoo would be, and they're biblical. Now, here's a third question. Someone might ask, what if I already have a tattoo? You know, we are aware of the fact that someone who already has a tattoo, to them a discussion like this 
might make them feel very self-conscious. But embarrassing people is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to examine Christian principles and then to make decisions that are the most in line with the Bible. If you have excessive body piercings, you can change that. If you have a ring in your nose, you can take it out. But if you already have a tattoo, short of spending a great deal of money to have it removed, there's not much you can do about it. It's like I heard one Christian man say, he said, when I became a Christian, baptism washed away my sins, but it couldn't wash off my tattoo. And that's right. But you know, that doesn't mean that you can't be a faithful Christian. I prefer to wear a suit and a tie now uh, because it hides the mistakes that I made in my past in getting tattooed. Um, I'm not that person anymore. I'm, I'm uh, a preacher of the gospel, and uh, I love my Lord. And I think that uh, for me to walk around showing all my tattoos like I used to is putting out a mixed message. I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the church, and I'm a part of the body of Christ, and part of that responsibility of being a part of the body is respecting that body of Christ. And I don't think that tattoos is any way to show that respect. Tattoos and excessive body piercings can hurt your influence. They can violate principles of modesty. They can pose risk to your health. They may result in poor stewardship. But if you already have them, it's not too late. They can't stop you from serving the Lord and from being a faithful Christian. You know, each one of us should have the attitude that the Apostle Paul did in Galatians 2 and 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, why did he say that? Because Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I live for the Lord. I want to look like I live for the Lord. And as 1 Timothy 5, 14 says, I don't want to give any occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully.